Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the effects of nucleophile strength and sterics on the SN2 reaction, namely how things like anionic character and lone pair availability are going to impact the ability to participate in SN2, and how substitution, i.e. primary, secondary, or tertiary carbons, relate to the SN2 process. Let's go ahead and get started. So I want to start off by sort of just summarizing the need for a nucleophile in the SN2 process and how that actually works to affect a substitution. So in an SN2 reaction, the nucleophile must attack the backside of the antibonding orbital between the carbon and the leaving group bond, right? So the carbon leaving group bond, the blue and gold atoms, have this purple orbital, the antibonding orbital between them, and the nucleophile can go ahead and attack the back end of that orbital from the opposite side. When this happens, the nucleophile proceeds to then break the carbon leaving group bond while forming a new bond to the carbon. Importantly, this is not like SN1 where the bond spontaneously ruptures. The nucleophile has to both A, get to the antibonding orbital to actually break the bond, and B, have sufficient nucleophilicity where the nucleophile has a greater affinity for the carbon than does the leaving group. If the nucleophile uh, does not have a very high degree of nucleophilicity, i.e. the nucleophile is very weak, it will not be able to effectively break the carbon leaving group bond. So of the two factors that we talked about, the first one we're going to address is the nucleophile actually getting to the antibonding orbital it needs to get to. So consider a methyl species where you have a CH3 group attached to a leaving group such as chloride. In this case, the hydrogens are very small and do not very much obstruct the path of the nucleophile towards the antibonding orbital. As a result, the nucleophile can very cleanly push its electron density into the antibonding orbital and break the carbon leaving group bond, releasing the chlorine anion. However, consider now a different scenario, where instead of hydrogens, we have three ethyl groups. These three ethyl groups are relatively long and free rotating in space because they're single bonds. As a result, there is a good chance that at any given time, one of the ethyl groups is going to have part of its uh, uh, group atoms near the antibonding orbital where the nucleophile has to attack. As a result, this will crowd out the nucleophile. It will prevent the nucleophile from actually getting to the antibonding orbital, and this will inhibit the SN2 reaction. The nucleophile can be extremely strong, but if the site is very crowded and has a lot of atoms flowing around the antibonding orbital, the nucleophile will not be able to access it and an SN2 reaction cannot occur. Because of this, the SN2 reaction has pretty clear cut substrate restrictions. So for example, let's consider our four main substrates. We can have methyl, primary, secondary, or tertiary substrates, which dictates, which is essentially telling you how many non-CH bonds does the carbon have in addition to the leaving group. So in the case of a methyl substrate, it only has the C leaving group bond, no other non-carbon hydrogen bonds. In the case of a tertiary substrate, we have three carbon-carbon bonds in addition to the C leaving group bond, which means that there's a lot more crowding on the tertiary substrate. On the methyl substrate, we have very little crowding. As a result, the methyl substrate is very reactive towards SN2. The hydrogens are very small and their bond lengths are short, so they don't really obstruct that antibonding orbital. On the other hand, a tertiary species is so crowded that it's way too hindered to even react at all via SN2. Right? So tertiary substrates do not react via SN2 pathways because they're too crowded. The nucleophile just can't get to the antibonding orbital. In general, you have decreasing reactivity of SN2 as you increase the substitution. So methyl groups are by far, or methyl substrates are by far the most reactive, followed by primary and then secondary. And then again, there's that line between secondary and tertiary, where secondary can react via SN2, but tertiary just cannot. It is important to mention that there are other kinds of substrates, like allylic and benzylic substrates, where the leaving group is adjacent to a, a pi bond or a benzene ring, these groups are more reactive than whatever the corresponding regular group is. So for example, a primary allylic substrate, one that has only one non-C uh, leaving group bond, but also has a pi bond adjacent to it, will be more reactive than a regular primary leaving group. 
However, the steric restrictions still apply. A tertiary species will never react via SN2 regardless of whether or not it has pi bonds adjacent to it. We'll talk later about why pi bonds actually enhance SN2 reactivity. Right, and then in terms of nucleophile strength, one of the things we want to consider is the fact that SN2 goes through what's known as an associative pathway. Right, the SN2 transition state is this trigonal bipyramid where you have quasi bonds to both the nucleophile and the leaving group at the same time. Hence, it is associative. It associates the nucleophile and the leaving group together. Because of this, the nucleophile has to be strong enough to actually form a bond to the carbon while breaking the carbon leaving group bond. It cannot rely on the leaving group bond breaking spontaneously. As a result, SN2 is strongly dependent on strong nucleophiles, right? Be and I'm just going to uh, state this explicitly. Because the transition state is associative, because it relies on the nucleophile attack, a strong nucleophile is needed to attack the antibonding orbital. It seems pretty trivial, and I know I've said it multiple times, but it's something that people often gloss over and tend to forget. So if you compare the electrostatic potential diagrams between OH- and H2O, you'll notice that the OH- has a much larger negative charge density all over itself, indicated by the red, as compared to H2O. This is because OH- is an anion, and so it has very large diffuse negative charge character. The negative anions are much better SN2 nucleophiles, they're much more willing to give up negative charge density than something that is neutral, like water. So your typical strong SN2 nucleophiles are going to be things like thiolates, RS-, alkoxides, RO-, or halides, H X-. You also see things like cyanide, Grignard reagents, and the one that's sort of a standout is amines and phosphines. Amines and phosphines do not have a negative charge, but they have a very available lone pair and can actually participate as SN2 nucleophiles. They're strong nucleophiles. Weak nucleophiles, or those that are too weak for SN2, are things like alcohols and water. Although oxygen has a lone pair, it's not very available because of oxygen's high electronegativity, and these will tend not to react via SN2. So if you put even a primary halide, something that's very reactive, in water, it will not tend to undergo the solvolysis reaction through an SN2 pathway, because water is just too weak of a nucleophile. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to learn more, check out our other videos in the chemistry playlist, and if you're looking to branch out, check out our other science playlists as well. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.